do Airbus, Boeing, BMW, cricket bats, fishing rods, and even prosthetic limbs have in common? Well, they're all increasingly using this, which is carbon fiber. We are here at Carbon Nexus, a carbon fiber and composite research facility. At a time when there's so much focus on research and innovation in India's educational institutions, it is interesting to know that this is all part of Deakin University's research and innovation wing. A whole host of Indian students also doing their research right here. This facility says it's ready to scale up to meet uh, the requirements of several industries as far as carbon fiber goes and eventually hope to be doing a lot more volume when it comes to carbon fiber production. So how exactly is carbon fiber weighed? I can't wait to find out. I'm sure neither can you. We're with uh, Steve Atkins. He's the general manager at Carbon Nexus. Thanks very much, Steve, for allowing us uh, this kind of access uh, here. No, you're more than welcome. Very much so. Uh, so let's get started right away. You're making carbon fiber, yeah. and it all begins here. It does, yeah. We start with a precursor material, which we source from uh, many different locations around the world, uh, dealing with the world's experts in precursor manufacture. They bring their fibers here to try and explore how to make carbon fiber quicker, safer, cheaper, basically hitting all the key points right. that end users of carbon fiber are interested in. Right. And it looks like this when you, when you get it. What yeah, you yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a spool of fiber, uh, which is polyacrylonitrile fiber, originally taken from the textile industry. It's been modified to handle some of the thermal processes that we apply the fiber to. These are 12 micron in diameter but they start off with all the base ingredients we need for making good, strong carbon fiber. And now, what's happening here? Okay, so we draw the fiber from the creel, mm. where the bobbins are held, we draw it in, and then we introduce it into its first thermal process. And in this process, what we're gonna do is basically drive a whole series of chemical reactions. Mm. Those reactions are going to stabilize the fiber. Carbon fiber, it's a material which is incredibly lightweight it's also incredibly strong. So you're talking a material which can be between five and 10% stronger than metal right. of equivalent uh, sort of uh, materials for uses in like uh, automotive or aerospace. It's also um, so it's stronger, it's lighter. It's also non-corrosive, mm. it's carbon. So we have um, the ability to put it into environments which typically metals would struggle in. Right. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you were making an important point there that it's, it's replacing steel and and some alloys it's lighter it's longer lasting how is it when it comes to the cost yeah cost traditionally carbon fiber has been viewed as an expensive material um, over the years you've seen it being reducing steadily from the hundreds of dollars per kilo down to the the low 30s 20 dollars per kilo um, but the industry um, for example automotive really want to see us down below 10 dollars per kilo that's 10 dollars us um, we are getting very close to that area which is making it very attractive for going into cars well we also sort of, this is of course great because it's part of a university and you have students who are involved in it hi Hi, thanks for speaking to us today. What's the experience, really, of, of seeing something like this? I mean, I would imagine well, it's incredible. I think that's amazing. Um, I mean, this could be seen as a production line, but as well as a laboratory. Mm -hmm. So it gives us, like, uh, very good tools to, um, to do research. So. Mm -hmm. Of course, very important. You know, in, in India, we're talking increasingly about having sort of been a bit slow on the bus on research mm -hmm. and therefore innovation. There is a young India very keen to innovate, very keen to come up with disruptive ideas. But research is something that we're only now sort of beginning in the last few years, beginning to set up and take no notice. And the fact that this is part of a university open for students yeah. is, is, is just uh, uh, the, one of the most impressive things about the facility. It is. I mean, this really proves that research and industry working together can have fantastic results. Okay. Um, research working in laboratories, uh, you know, sometimes those ideas can be pretty blue sky you know there's a sort of not realistic to industry and then again industry don't really pay enough attention to research where are we now 
Yeah, so it's passed through a series of oxidation ovens, and what we have is a fiber that comes out of the process that's thermally stabilized, completely fireproof. Now, that's really important because the next process it's going to be introduced to is a furnace, and this furnace is going to put the fiber into temperatures up to 1,000 degrees oh, wow. centigrade. Okay. Okay. So, and with that process, it's going to lose a lot of its weight. We're going to take off everything that's not carbon. Remember, it's I carbon see. fiber. Right. And we're going to restructure those carbon molecules into a crystalline structure to build up the properties. But we don't need the other things that are attached right. to the fiber. Right. So why has it changed color? It, it was some a pale gold when we began. Yes. Why are we now looking at it black? Okay, what we have is a, a basically a thermally stabilized fiber. Okay. So we've added oxygen molecules to the actual fiber after a cyclization reaction. I see. So those reactions have taken place. You're seeing the results of thermal application under tension on this particular type of fiber. Okay. So it's nothing more than chemical reactions that have resulted in this black color. Okay. And how long, Steve, have you been involved in, in this facility? Uh, I've been involved with this facility for three years. I actually designed the entire process line. Oh, wow. So I've had around about 20 years in the carbon fiber industry, producing, designing, commissioning, and you've training. Seen it grow, really? I have. I've seen it from a very small, almost a cottage industry, right, right. to uh, things where we're now introducing this into things like the Boeing 787 Dreamliner and the Airbus A320, wow. A380, uh, and also BMWs. Um, you know, their, their, their uh, introduction into using carbon fiber in a commercial vehicle like the i3. So I really start seeing it from very small pieces to aircraft, you're now flying around in it. So it's, it's very exciting. So now what's happening here, Steve? We've seen the fibers changed color yep. and you've put it through another furnace upping the temperature as you go along. We have, yes. We're going to introduce the fiber now to the LT furnace, stripping off all the non-carbon atoms. So we're really starting to define what that carbon fiber is. Uh, we're starting to build up its strength, build up its modulus, reduce its diameter, really starting to make it into a high-performance material. And what is this? This is a very sort of yet another fancy... Yes, it is, yeah. Obviously, we're stripping off these uh, molecules, see. and these molecules come off as, as gas. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do, first of all, is cool the fiber down because it's at a thousand degrees. We don't want that out into the factory, but also we want to make sure we keep all of those gases inside the furnace. The gases are toxic. Right. So we also take those gases once they've been produced and we take them away to our incinerator where we destroy and break those components down for emission to the environment. So we're looking at emitting only the safe gases. All other gases are destroyed. And here we are, it's out of the furnace for a second or third time? Yeah, this, this is the first time it comes out of the furnace. Okay. So it's passed through oxidation. It's now through the pre-carbonization LT furnace. So we have a fiber that is still in filament form. And so, it's feeling different now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this really has, it's, it's reduced its weight by, as I say, 44%. So the actual fiber diameter has come down as well, but the strength has now started to really build up. So uh, yes, it's a completely different fiber. And it is a fiber that's used as, as, as uh, when it comes out of the LT, it's actually used in different products as it stands right now. It doesn't really need to go any further, but um, so it can be used in uh, like gasket material for high okay. temperature applications, like an engine block, for example. Um, but we use it as the feedstock for going into okay. the high temperature furnace, really to start building up those properties for different applications. So we, we've passed through the carbonization process. Right. We've reformed it again. Now, at this point here, we've got pure carbon fiber. Okay, okay. so nothing added to it. This is the purest form that we can make. Pure carbon fiber no surface treatment, no other treatments to it. It now allows us to really work with this fiber to do different things, to help it work better in a composite. Right. So we're thinking about the end product now. End product, right. So in this part of the process here, we electrochemically etch the fiber. Okay, so it's basically like um, almost rubbing the surface of the fiber with sandpaper to key it ready to accept a resin to bond to it. I see. So it's like, okay. you know, like you would a piece of metal, you right. would rough up the surface to right. paint it. Right. We have to do the same with carbon right. fiber. So we rough up the surface. Um, we wash it in this area here, and then we introduce it to a coating process known as sizing. And in sizing, we can apply a low molecular weight epoxy. 
in solution, okay? And that basically puts a protective layer over the carbon fiber because we know that the fiber is going to be introduced to a weaving type process and those machines can be quite aggressive on fibers. So we put the protective layer on to help the carbon fiber pass through that process. Great, and is this, is this the final product? Well, it's the final product on the actual process line once it's dried. At this okay. point here, normally this would be wet. This, I see. So okay. this bath would be raised, this I would see. be submerged, fibre passes through. We then pass through to a drying tower. So we drive off all the water we use to transfer the epoxy onto the fibre, dry it off here. So when the fibre comes out the bottom of this cooling tower, um, the fibre is then basically classed as being a, fi a finished carbon fibre product. But in reality, we really need to deliver it onto the winder, okay? The winder is where we collect the finished product. And even then, we can get it wrong. So we have to have a look at how do we collect it. Explain when you say, what, what do you mean by you could get it wrong? Yeah, so if we collect a spool incorrectly, you could have the fiber falling off the edge of the toe. If we have a look at this, if this fell off like this, and it was being processed in the next process, it would maybe fall off the end, which would make it unusable. So it'd be very difficult to use this in any other process. It would start breaking up and, you know, be a problem. So what we're looking for is really nice, precise layering up of the fibers, nice sharp edges on the fibers, so that yes, we've made it and we've collected it, but we need it to come off the spool perfectly. So that's a bit of a bit of work involved in getting that right as well. So this is here, and, yeah. and now if, how does Boeing use this? They would take this. Yeah, they would take this fiber, they would then uh, mo most likely um, weave it into a cloth, into a fabric. I see. And that fabric would have a resin impregnated into the actual fabric itself. Okay. And then it would be shaped and cured, as in set solid. So it's set solid as, as almost as hard as a metal component. Okay. Um, so that's basically what they would do. So they would layer these fibers up in different ways. There's lots and lots of different techniques of layering fiber up to get strength in certain directions and get different flexes in the fibers. So they, it really is a very, very flexible uh, uh, material. Now it's also replacing metal parts. Now with, with it being a fabric, you can shape a fabric into any shape. Right. Many different shapes. Whereas in metal parts, you would need maybe many metal parts, many metal parts to right. rivet together and fix together. So you'd avoid all of those fixings. So it becomes extremely flexible on that point too. Are these the same? They're all identical. Different? Yeah, that's, that's the beauty of this line. We can produce 30 spools, right. all exactly the same, so that when we put this into a composite, we know the base material is identical. I so see. we're not using different batches to make up a piece of fabric, for example. And how much of this, what you're doing here, is ready for industrial use or is being picked immediately, up by in Immediately, immediately. Yeah, so as soon as we produce these fibers, we know this is an industrial grade sure. winder. We've, we've processed it on an industrial carbon fiber line. Um, so yes, all, and the fibers themselves. Yeah, we can test these to a very, very finite degree to say, this is a good fiber, it's commercially uh, viable. Uh, we also know the cost as well. We know exactly how much it costs to produce this fiber. So uh, yeah, from every point of view, from a business point of view, industrial, we've got that covered as well as the research. So really, you know, for, you're all from India, as well, right? So from everything that Steve's been saying to us, this really is great experience, right? From the beginning yep. to the end of it. I mean, you've also got, uh, I'm not quite sure, but you've also got sort of the interaction with industry thrown in and sort of try and see. So what's the experience been like? Um, it's been great. So I finished a bachelor's here and as soon as I finished my bachelor's, I got a job here. So it's a really new, good company. And then I'm thinking to build my experience here and move and try to work as much as I can and then try to help this company and build my experience on top of that. Right. What was the research experience like? Um, I mainly work as a technician here. I so see. I mainly do all the tests which I, which um, this company, the, the fibers which company produces. So you're part of the innovation that they're yeah. involved in. Basically, yeah. Right. yeah. There's so much that you can gain as a student, can't you, uh, Steve? Because there's, there's just so much on offer. There's just so much on there offer. Really what do you believe is the one thing that students are gaining which perhaps they wouldn't sort of get anywhere else? So you need these kind of facilities and this kind of focus on research and innovation to take students, to prepare students for of tomorrow. Yeah, we're basically taking the coursework that a student would take um, in a typical university and applying real life application. It's real industry working with academia. So you can imagine a student leaving the likes of Deakin University, 
they've got their qualification, but they've also got years of industrial manufacturing experience to combine with it. So immediately their CVs or their resumes are well populated with real life experience and a good qualification at the same time. So immediately when they go looking for a job, they're one step ahead of the rest, which, yeah, that's the biggest benefit I see. That's what great research and innovation does. Steve, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure being here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.